righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Welcome to the church next door. Why don't you have a seat and grab the communion cup that we have set out for you. This is the weekend where we honor and remember, commemorate, celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by taking the supper that he instituted and passed on to us. And I think this is a great weekend to do this. This is 4th of July weekend. I took uh, my wife and daughter down to uh, Huntington Park, the Clippers Field, to watch the uh, fireworks, red, white, and boom, Friday night. And we're there, we're seeing the fireworks, we're listening to the music over and over again. I'm hearing the words freedom and free. And I truly believe we have that in America. I believe that's a unique American quality. I am thankful for American freedom. I stand for uh, the national anthem. I pledge allegiance to the flag. I put my heart, uh, hand over my heart. Absolutely believe in it. Don't want to take anything away from that, but I, I do also want to acknowledge that our American forefathers in 1776 did not come up with this idea of freedom on their own. It wasn't something that they invented. It has always been the will of the Father for his creation to be free. He made us to be free. We sacrificed that when we listened to the enemy and followed him instead of the Lord. 
And the Lord has been endeavoring ever since to bring us back into freedom. He did that with the sacrifice of his son, sending his son to teach us how to be free and then ultimately paying the price so that we could be free. Isaiah prophesied about Jesus. He said he'd come to set the captives free. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Jesus said, uh, the, the, who the Son of Man sets free, that's him, himself, who I set free is free indeed. So freedom is a core part of our faith. Our American forefathers, they simply understood that and incorporated it into our nation. And so what I'd like us to do is we celebrate communion together this morning. If you take your emblems, if you're at home, please go and, and grab some emblems as well quickly because we want you to do this with us. I want us to remember that freedom as we remember Jesus and his sacrifice and his coming again this morning. So take these emblems, open them up. Take the bread that you have here, hold it up, and just simply repeat after me, Lord Jesus Christ, I remember the price you paid that I might be free. Amen. Again, repeat after me, please. Lord Jesus Christ, I receive the freedom you have brought me. Body, soul, spirit, heart, mind, strength, and will. Amen. Indeed, Lord Jesus Christ, we remember you today and we receive with great thanks everything that you have done for us today. We commemorate you, we celebrate you, we believe that the wonderful things we have here in this country is a direct result of the wonderful thing you did at Calvary. May it always be in our hearts and in our minds. Amen.
Redemption, freedom, breakthrough, salvation. Freedom from anger, from worry, from depression, from anxiety, from grief. God, in those moments of grief, you are close to us. It says that you are near to the brokenhearted, that those that call upon you, you don't leave behind. that you're aware, perfectly aware of the problems that we have and you care about them, that you're there with us through those issues. Right now, we call upon your name in full confidence, knowing that you are going to have us see breakthrough because of your namesake, because you have been faithful and mighty to save. God, help us to trust you and, and know that your timing is not always our timing, but still you are a good God and a loving Father. In the midst of all that we see, all that we hear, and all that we interact with, we trust you today, and we make the declaration to lift up a battle cry in the form of these worship songs and in the form of the way that we live our lives, that your name might be famous, that people would know that through you, freedom and salvation are found. You're a good God. We praise you today. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We praise you today. In Jesus' name, everybody say, amen. Truly, we cry out, holy, holy, holy. It's a powerful thing when we do that as one voice. Amen. You can take a seat. Welcome to The Church Next Door. My name is Lucia, and if this is your first time joining us here or online, we want to let you know that we are so glad you have chosen to spend this weekend with us. Just text CONNECT to 888-644-4034 or fill out a Connect card that you can find in the seat pocket in front of you and take it to the guest welcome counter in the lobby, and they'll have a gift for you just for stopping by. And be sure to check out our website at thechurchnextdoor.org for more information. Our mission at The Church Next Door is to help move people closer to God. Our regular weekend service times are on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 9.20 and 11 a.m. You can join us at those times here inside the church or online on Facebook Live or on our website. 
You can even listen in your car on 95.3 FM as well. Hey Church Next Door, my name's Addie. You've probably seen me on the worship team and you're probably wondering why I'm dressed as a camp counselor. And it's because we have something so exciting in store for this summer. We're starting a brand new series called Summer Camp here at the Church Next Door. This isn't a vacation Bible school or a summer camp for kids. This is for the whole family to learn and grow together here at the Church Next Door. So Summer Camp is gonna be a six week long series and we're gonna focus on three main topics. We're gonna focus on prayer camp, worship camp and Holy Spirit camp. This isn't something that we made where you just come to a couple and then you maybe miss a few because you're traveling. We want you guys engaged every single week to learn and grow together in camp. So if you miss some weeks, you can catch up online. We're gonna have these awesome camp journals for you guys to take notes each service. And when you complete a course at TCND, you'll get these badges that you can put in your camp journals to mark that you completed summer camp. So we're so excited to get started. Summer camp starts July 16th and 17th here at the church next door. We can't wait to go to camp with you. All right, back again to lead us in our time of giving and offering. That's what we're going to do right now. I know many of you have already given. My family and I got together on the first and we gave digitally. That's how we like to do it. But uh, if you've already done that, we do want to thank you. But if you haven't, now is the time. As we come into that time, I just want to, to tell you a brief story about something that happened uh, for me when I was in small groups a couple years ago. This was back in California. We had a, a pastor's group that met on Tuesday mornings and all we would do is we would get together and we had a reading plan and we would just open up that plan, whatever the scripture said, whatever the scripture was, that's what we would read. And then we'd say, you know, what is the Lord bringing to you uh, here in, in this verse? So on this particular Tuesday, the leader who was my mentor, uh, the verse was Isaiah 41.10, which I already knew. I knew in the NIV, which says, do not be dismayed. But he asked uh, the Presbyterian minister to read it, and, and, and the Presbyterian minister read it in a different version. I think it was English standard. I don't know for sure. I just know that this version didn't say, do not be dismayed. Instead, it said, do not look about anxiously. And when I heard that, that new translation, when I heard that same truth but put a slightly different way, the Lord spoke to me in that. He said, see, here's what you do. You get scared. And when you get scared, you start desperately searching for an exit. You'll be happy with any exit, and that exit usually hurts you more than anything else does. So knock it off. Stop doing that. That's a word from the Lord that has blessed me ever since. I can't, five, six years ago, that word from God has blessed me ever since. That's what can happen when you go to a small group or worship service or you do devotions. That's why I'm so adamant about these things. You need to be in church. You need to be doing devotions. You need to be in a small group because you never know when the Lord's going to say something to you that is going to bless your life forever. So I've got two invitations for you at this time this morning. The first is to join a small group. If you're not part of a small group yet, we have some that meet uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. We've got some other ones that we are uh, uh, planning for the end of, uh, of summer, the beginning of fall. So you can find a group. They are listed online. You can also just text me at that number that's on your notes, and we will help you find a group. So if you're not part of a group, find a group. But the second invitation is to support our groups. And by that, I mean financially. You know, this is what the offering that we collect, this is what it does. It gives us the resources to do these groups, to do kids ministry, to do our uh, Teens Next Door ministry, to do all the things that we are doing to try to get people together so that they can hear the, the Lord, give them a blessed word. That is what you're, you're giving finances. So couple ways to do that. You can drop an offering physically in the box in the back, or you can do as my family and I like to do. You can take the digital route, click the give button on the website or the app, and it will take you through that process. Let's thank God for the opportunity he's given us to join in his work. And then Pastor Doyle is going to come. He's going to bring us a great message this morning. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have done such good things for us. We're thankful that you are doing good things through us. Take the offerings we bring you now. Make them do wonderful things here in our community, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Freedom. 
It's something we cherish in this country. The idea of a free society is embedded into the very core of our nation. Many have died defending it, and many have fought diligently to preserve it. So where has it gone? We've become a nation bound by division, chained by hatred, and consumed by selfishness. There's an epidemic of violence, poverty, brokenness. Does this look like freedom? The Bible tells us we're called to be free, but it also says to use that freedom to serve one another humbly, in love. Maybe that's what we're missing in America. Today, we celebrate Independence Day. Perhaps it's time we recognize that true independence is found only in a lasting dependence on God. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Amen. That's good stuff. Wow, that's to me, that is so encouraging because that's what we're celebrating this weekend. We're celebrating the freedom that comes through Christ Jesus. We're celebrating that, that God has put us together as a nation. That doesn't mean that we're unique in, in the sense that God is the one that puts together every nation. He is the builder and the maker of nations, and, and that's his nature to build us and to be a people, to be a, what is unique about our nation is that our founding, our, our founding fathers, the, the men and women that prayed for the beginning of our nation, they believed that our life came from God, that he is the God of providence and that he is the one that, that made us and he is the one that brought us together. And we recognized in our, in our making that God was working. And so this weekend, we've done something a little bit special. We've decided to really lean in to the 4th of July. And, and so we've done uh, Hot Takes Part 2. And so this weekend, it's our 4th of July edition. So last night, I taught a lesson about One Nation Under God. And then this morning at uh, 9 o'clock, I taught the second part of that series. It, it was all about uh, the, the fact that we are a nation, that uh, there is a separation between church and state. But it, it doesn't have to be a separation for us as, as Christ followers. That, that, that doesn't mean that we don't get to participate. It's the exact opposite of that. If you want to go back and listen to those that you can. But do me a favor right now. And look at your neighbor and say, freedom is best. Yeah. I mean, that's, an easy, that's easy to think. Well, well, of course freedom is best. Who wants you to be bound? Well, well the problem is there are a lot of people that want us to, to rely on a source other than God. And God is the only source for true freedom. Last night, we looked at the fact in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 9, Jesus, no, chapter 8, Jesus is teaching. He says, the truth will set you free. So there's, there's something about Jesus and the freedom that he has, okay? Well, today, I want to take some time. I want us to take a little bit of time, and let's look at amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Now, now the reason I want to look at that is because that song... It was launched into our world at a particular time in history. And I believe it's because God was doing something. And I want you to know, I believe that God is doing something today. I believe that God is working in the world in which we live. I believe that God has been making himself real for those who want to listen to God, to those that want to seek God, to those that, that really want to, want to cherish God's ways and wants to, to follow God's ways, God has been speaking very loudly to us, and he's been inviting us to trust him. We as a church have been trusting God. We have been looking to God in this season. Uh, we've always done that, but we've been really pretty intent on that. We've been looking for ways to share the amazing grace of God in this season. I mean, this week, we are celebrating as a church, whether you're aware of it or not, we're celebrating the fact that we have two new people that have been called to be a part of our team. All right, Jasmine Porter, some of you know Jasmine. She grew up here. She's part of the church. And, and she agreed that God was calling her to lead the children's ministry. Andrew Courtney, 
He is coming to be with us. He feels called to lead the youth ministry. Why is that? Because we are optimistic. We are hopeful. We believe that God has a future for us. God is not done. God is still very real and powerful and vibrant, and you and I are a part of that. Amen? Amen. All right. So if you have not met Jasmine or Andrew, please do get to know them because they're going to be your teammates in raising up the next generation in the grace of God. So let's talk about the amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Now, can I, can I say that this, that this is just one thing. I, I know that some people are offended by grace. Now, that may seem odd to you as someone who believes in God. Well, how can they be offended by grace? Listen, there's always a choice when it comes to God. You can choose to be offended, or you can choose to say, wow, that's conviction. That's the Holy Spirit telling me I need to adjust my standard to his standard. Do you hear the difference? See, if, if you've chosen an ungodly lifestyle, if you've chosen to believe that God does not exist, if you've chosen to walk in the, in the ways of the world, to live under the influence of this world, you will be offended by the idea that you need God, that you need God's help, that, that God is somehow powerful and that can impact your life because you've rejected him. If you are offended by the notion of grace, I'm just... I'm assuming that means you are offended by the notion of God. And I would challenge you to reconsider and believe that the complexity of the life that we live in is so great it could not evolve on its own power, that it needed something greater than itself. The world in which we live in needed something greater than itself to become what it is today, and I believe that to be the living God. So that leaves me with only one option, doesn't it? That when I feel that my life is not in connection with God, not relationship with God, if I'm out of step with Him, I'll feel convicted. In the same way, when you and I say something unkind to someone we love, we'll feel conviction because we realize that will break the relationship. That's inappropriate for someone in relationship. See, as we're in relationship with God, we recognize His Spirit. This song that you and I celebrate in our culture, and what's interesting about Amazing Grace, it is revered by people that believe in God and people that do not believe in God. Its origin, its origin is a man who grew up without God. The story of Amazing Grace is really the story of John Newton's life. John Newton grew up in a home that, that did not have God. He did not attend church. He knew very little, if anything, about God. He finds himself in the Royal Navy, and the next thing you know, when he comes out of the Royal Navy, he finds himself being the captain of a slave ship. Now, you have to realize that he had rejected God. He was opposed to God. When people would bring up the notion of God, he was one of those offended individuals. He saw himself as a self-made man, meaning that he was the sum total of his life. You and I as God followers view it very differently. We believe that the life that we have has been given to us from God, that part of our identity is the fact that we have a creator, a father in heaven who loves us and designed us for a purpose. John Newton was opposed to that worldview. He believed that he was in control of his life until, until a storm hit his life. That's right. He was on board a ship. I want to make sure I get the facts right. It was 1748. His ship was being tossed in the sea. In the midst of his fear, he cried out to God. He prayed a prayer that if God would have mercy, that he would give his life to God. And in the midst of that storm that night, he had a conversion moment. Now, you say, well, he was, he was forced into it. No, he wasn't. Every one of us has to admit that the circumstances of life is what has directed us towards a loving relationship period. You would say that if I ask you, how did you meet your spouse? you would say that the circumstances brought us together. Who has been in charge of the circumstances of your life? See, in his life, in, and on board that now you have to realize, 
He's, he's leading a slave ship. He's leading a very ungodly life according to your standard and mine, correct? And, and yet, in the midst of that storm, he cries out to God. It took him eight more years to leave behind slavery completely. I imagine that if you and I will be honest in this place, the grace of God showed up in our life and it took several more years for the complete transformation to, to go on in our life. And, and you might be willing to admit possibly that the grace of God is still transforming you today and it's been more than eight years. See, that's what it is to live under the conviction of a loving God in relationship with Him. And that's what amazing grace is really about, is that you believe that there is a Creator and that He has called you and invited you to a loving relationship with Him. That's what amazing grace is about. And this weekend, as we celebrate the independence of our nation, you need to know that our forefathers, our foremothers, that the individuals that sailed here were looking for a different way of life under the grace of God, whether that you go to Plymouth and, and you look at those founders or you go to Jamestown, each one of those people, they were looking for a freedom, a new kind of life, and, and they saw that God was an intricate part of that. I challenge you to go back and to honestly look at the historical count, their own record, their own journals, their own letters. What were they reading? They were reading the Word of God. The problem that you and I have, the problem that every generation has, is that we live in a world of noise. There are a lot of things that try to keep us from hearing the sweet sound of God's amazing grace. Now, you and I live in a generation like no other. We have the availability of noise because of our earbuds 24 hours a day. We have thousands of channels. We have thousands of podcasts, we have thousands of, you name it, to entertain us so that we, we keep from hearing God. But you want to know, I believe, are the loudest noises that keep us from thinking about God? I made a brief list, and I'll let you contemplate it. I believe the loudest noise is fear. We, we, we fear the things of this world, and we, we use fear as a constant enticement for you and I to click on this, to, to check in on that. And it, it suddenly will take away our whole day because we're motivated by fear. Anger. Anger is one of the second emotions that our world uses to try to get us involved, to get us moving. And, and see, what will anger? Anger will take you down a wrong path. And, and you, may, you may say, but I'm justified in my anger. I need to stand up for myself. Uh, listen, is anger going to bring about the outcome that you hope to have? Ask yourself. Ask yourself. Thirdly is pride. Pride in our generation means that, 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 that like John Newton, we think that we are self-made individuals, that we can rely on our own strength, that our own power is all that we need. I, I have enough power in my own strength. Can I tell you, age and time will catch up with you. Age and time will catch up with you. You will find out that you're not as strong as you thought you were, and you will have to rely on someone else for something. See, God has called you. He has designed you to have a relationship with Him. You and I are designed for relationship. The storm of our generation has been an attempt to get us to separate from one another, and it has made us weaker. A belief that we do not need one another, that just the fellowship of one another has made us less than we ought to be. When we are together in the presence of God, see, pride has to admit that it's not all that it was made up to be. And that's the moment you step into humility. And that's why we recognize God. And the last one is desperation. The world wants to make you feel desperate and hopeless. But Christ Jesus came to take away your fear, to relieve you of anger, to, to let you know that you are not alone and you don't have to be self-reliant and you don't have to be desperate anymore. And our nation's founders recognize that. They gathered and they prayed as they, they wrote the Declaration of Independence. They fasted as they wrote our Constitution. They said, God, we cannot do this without you. They knew their lives were on the line. And see, they were inviting us into the amazing grace of God. Now, 
what, it, what, what the amazing grace of God does not do is alleviate us from all the pains of this world. And that, that is confusing to us. It's, it's frustrating to us. John Newton wrote Amazing Grace in 1772. Hmm. I submit to you that God was doing something in the world at that season. In our nation, beginning in the 1720s and on up through the 1740s, all right, 20 to 30 years of revival took place in the American colonies. Yes, it was led by a movement that had gone on in England under um, the Wesley brothers, but also here we had men like George Whitfield. We had, we had others that were part of the colonies that were preaching, and we had this, this great revival, and it, it brought us unity. And when, when, the, when the song Amazing Grace came out and it was finally published in 1779, just after our revolution, it went like wildfire among the, the believers. Because it was, there was this common resonance. It's true. I needed God's grace to live this life, to live in this world. It was only God's grace that helped me in this life. At the key junctures of our nation history, it was as the believers sought God, read His Word, worshipped Him, prayed, and called ourselves back to a holy living under Him have we been transformed, and our nation would rise again and again. That is our history. I want to invite you this weekend to cry out to God and say, God, I personally need more of your grace. God, my neighbors need more of your amazing grace. May they hear the sweetness of the sound and the forgiveness and the goodness of grace that we might be transformed and be the nation that you've called us to be. There's another song in American history that's amazing and powerful. And I, I want to bring it to you on this weekend. You, you probably know about it. You may even know a, a little about how it was written, but I want to introduce you to the man that wrote this song. This song, you know it and I know it as it is well with my soul. But the man that wrote it is Horatio Spafford. Now, Horatio Spafford was the son of a a journalistic empire from Chicago. They had a huge paper and they'd made money in the paper and then on into real estate. And Horatio Spafford um, was an elder. He was a friend of Dwight L. Moody. He, he had been a part of, of evangelical Christianity in, in his generation. Now, in 18, I want to make sure I get the date right. In 1871, the Great Fire of Chicago took place. So this is 100 years after our beginning as a nation. The whole city was basically burned down. And Spatford lost everything, all of his real estate. Everything was burned to the ground, every, everything that he owned, and he had to start over again. And it was in the midst of that rebuilding that his family decided that they were going to take a trip to Wales. It's 1773. Because of the rebuilding of some of their property and some of the things, he could not get on board the ship with his wife and his four children. And on their way, another ship hits their ship, and it goes down. Over 250 people lose their life as that ship goes down. And Spafford loses four of his daughters. His wife somehow survives, and when she gets to Wales, she sends him a telegram and says that she is the only one that was saved. He goes, he leaves here to travel the Atlantic on the same pathway to get to his wife, to comfort her in her, her grief, and that's when he writes the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Now that's pretty amazing. I, wanna, I, wanna, I just want to remind you of the words 
from it is well with my soul. So I put them in my phone. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ had regard my helplessness estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. My sin on the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. He was totally dependent on Christ Jesus. Now, he and his wife, they get back together, and God gives them three more children. Pretty amazing. But his, the eldest of that set of children dies to a fever. So he has two left. His youngest daughter, he names Grace. Hmm. You think he believed in Grace? I believe so. I mean, when you, when you look at this man's life, it's, it's like something out of the book of Job. Would you not say? He'd lost his wealth. He'd lost his friends to a greater part. In 1881, he and his wife and their two children, they moved to Jerusalem. Yeah. To start a ministry to Jews, Muslims, and Christians. They opened a soup kitchen to feed the poor. They, they, they become known as, as the people that have fully entrusted their lives to God, and they start what's called the American Colony. It's still there to this day. There's a little section of Jerusalem they call American Colony, and it's because of Horatio Spatford. How can they do that? Why not be angry at God? Why not be fearful in life? Why not fear desperate? Because he is totally and completely dependent on the grace of God. He realized that the life he lives, that all that he has is the gift of God. And on this day, as a nation, historically, that is what we've celebrated. We've celebrated the grace of God that has enabled us to go forward. Because we knew even though we might get buffeted, we may feel overwhelmed that his grace would be enough in our lives. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. Proverbs 14, 34. Our generation would tell you that the, what is best, the best prescription for our nation is to be a secular people, to set God to the side. The Bible disagrees. God's people have historically disagreed. And we have said, no, the most important thing we could do is lean into the grace of God. Let the grace of God be the wind of your life. Let the hope of Jesus Christ and the cross give you the courage to move forward. That it is only through Christ Jesus and his shed blood that you can reach your greatest potential in life. And as a nation, that is our greatest hope, our greatest goal would be to honor him. Does that mean that we want to enact a state religion? No, far from it. What we want to encourage is an individual liberty that comes through Christ Jesus, that all might seek his face and live honorably before him. That is our goal as Christians in this nation. We need to pray for our leaders and live like believers. Jesus is the Lord. He is the, the, the source of grace in our nation. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, it says, I urge you, this is Paul to young Timothy, how to lead the church. He says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, and intercession, and thanksgiving. He gives them four different kinds of prayer to be made for all people, not just for the people inside the church, but people outside the church for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceable and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, 
who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. What is this? This is the gospel of peace. It says the only thing that will make us whole is the grace of God dispensed through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. To believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, He was crucified, and on the third day He rose again. This is our gospel. This is our truth. This is what we rely on. And as we celebrate that, as we pray for that, as we seek that, you and I do not have to be troubled by the things of this world. We do not have to let our heart be troubled. Jesus came peacefully. Jesus came that we might have peace. What were his first words to the disciples in the upper room? Peace be with you. Look at your neighbor and say, peace be with you. Tell your friends online, peace be with you. Let them know that the goal of the church is to bring peace. Now, what is that peace? That peace is a connection with the living God. The word shalom. I, I was in Jerusalem and I, and, I, and I paid my bill for breakfast one morning. The young lady came and she gave me the ticket. And, and, and I said, tell me, what is the word to, to pay your bill? And she said, le shalom. To be made complete. That everything has been paid. When you and I rely on Jesus Christ to pay your price, to pay the price for your sin, it has been completed. You mean all the rejection that I received from, from my family growing up? I can let that go and let the cross of Jesus Christ pray for it? Amen. So be it. You mean, you mean the harm that I've received in my life? I, I, I can let it go through the cross of Jesus Christ? Definitely he paid the price. You mean the sins that I've committed, the wrongs that I've done, that Jesus can take care of that? Absolutely. That's why he came. Do not continue under the burden. Do not contender, continue to feel that you, you deserve to be judged. Say, Lord, I, I put the judgment on you, and I thank you that I have been set free. That is how John Newton could say, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, to save a wretch like me. That's what we're to pray for. When you pray for our government, you pray that the amazing grace of God would fill every school, every household, every neighborhood, every corner of this nation, from north to south and east to west, and may we be good enough, may we be worthy enough to share that hope with the world beyond our nation. Amen? See, that is the point. That's why we celebrate. It's not because we are good enough. It's because God was good enough to make us into a people united. In James chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Pastor Doug preached on this last weekend. I refer you back. Can such faith save them? Absolutely not. Suppose brother or sister is without clothes and without daily food. Help them. That's why we have Jordan's Crossing. It's why we're still building an orphanage in Africa. We're going to finish it. It's coming close. Soon there will be children living under the, the covering of your love for God and the grace of Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. When you and I walk in faith and we live in grace, it's dispensed to help other people. That's the goal. It's why Horatio Spafford went to Jerusalem. He wanted it to go all the way to Jerusalem. It's why we went to Jerusalem. You need to know something. Horatio Spafford died in 1888. He was buried on Mount Zion, less than 100 feet from where Jennifer and I lived while we were there. There was a cemetery next to the school. It's the cemetery that Horatio Spatford is buried in it. I can take you there to see his grave. Let our lives be known as the dispensers of God's grace. We are the recipients of God's grace but may we be known 
as those that gave it away like candy at a 4th of July parade. Amen? And I'm sorry we didn't get to be in the parade this year, all right? Amazing grace is free, Romans 3, 23, 24, and 25. If, if you go to Romans chapter 3, just read about God's faithfulness and the context of this. What Paul is saying is that God has always been involved in the, in the, the, the things of this world, that the whole world is groaning and desiring for the God of creation to be made real in their life. Listen, the reason that there is so much fear, anger, and desperation in the world in which we live is because we are separated from God. God, and we are desperate need for him. That's why they feel that way. It creates tension. When you live far from God, it makes you tense. But when you come close to him, you feel his peace. You feel his serenity. This is why, this is why the people in your life that are ungodly, they like your home. Now, it does convict them. And so sometimes they feel a little bit judged but that's because in their heart, they recognize, I'm not living up to the standard of God. I, I want peace, but I don't feel like I deserve peace. You don't. But through the grace of God, you get peace. And you have to be willing to admit, I need peace. I'm desperate for peace. I want peace. God, would you just give me a piece of Jesus that I might have peace? For all have sinned, say all, does that include you? Yeah. All right. It includes me. I know that. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So God held up those sins so that he could put them on his own son, so that he could put your and my sins on his son, so that we could all be set free. And Jesus showed up personally, and he gave himself as our righteousness. And today, as a nation, we celebrate the freedom that we have, but we celebrate the freedom not by our own blood, but the, by the blood of Jesus. Now, have you and I had freedom in this nation because men and women were willing to spill their blood that we might have that? Yes. And the question is, will you and I give of our lives so the next generation might know him? I tell you, we will. It's why we have called Jasmine and Andrew. It's why we show up every week. It's why we worship God. It's why we pray. It's why we seek his face. And it's why we go before God regularly and say, God, if there is any offensive way in me, make it real to me that I might confess that, apply it to the cross, and be set free because I do not want to live with anything that would separate me from your love. And this... this this weekend, as we celebrate the birth of our nation, let's celebrate the new life that we have in Christ Jesus. And let's honor him. And can I say this? If you do not remember the day when you accepted Jesus, do it today. Do it today. It doesn't matter if you're online or you're in this room. All you have to do right now is just say, Oh God, like John Newton, I need to recognize you is the Lord of my life. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Savior. Take away all my sins. And, and I give myself completely to you from this day forward. That's what it is. It's an admission that you need him. And he'll do it. And I encourage you, you can share with us online or you can come talk to someone down front after the service. We'd love to talk with you more about it and help you on this new journey. You're on a journey towards God, and that's what we need most of all. Can you say amen? amen. All right, so let's do this. If you would stand, we're going to say a prayer, and we're going to ask God to give us the vision for the future of our lives and our nation, okay? Say this with me. Heavenly Father, my life has purpose. Because you have given me life. And I pray that you would make your grace clear to me. 
May it touch every corner of my life that all darkness would be gone. And help me to share your grace with the world around me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, God bless you. We hope you are encouraged and challenged to grow in your relationship with Jesus by this message. If you'd like to learn more about The Church Next Door, stop by our website at thechurchnextdoor.org or look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. 